All right. We're reading the final chapter of Hudson Taylor, Deep in the Heart of China by Janet and Jeff Bangi. Chapter 15 is titled, A Man in Christ. By Christmas of 1869, Hudson and Maria had made the most difficult decision of their married lives. Their four oldest children, Herbert, Howard, Samuel, and Maria, were to, were to be sent back to England to stay with their grandparents. It would be safer for them there, and they could go to a regular school. At that time, it was quite normal for children to be sent home like this, but it still upset Hudson and Maria to think that they wouldn't be seeing their children for a long time. They decided to keep one-year-old Charles with them because he was too young to be separated from his parents. Also, Maria was pregnant again and due to give birth in the middle of the year, so Charles would have a playmate. Emily Blatchley would take the children back on the ship with her. She had contracted tuberculosis and needed treatment in England. The family had much to do to prepare for the trip to Shanghai, where the children's ship would depart for England. As they prepared, Samuel was not well, but no one knew how sick he was until February when they began the journey to Shanghai. As they traveled by boat down the Yangtze River, Samuel slipped into a coma and died. In the middle of a rainstorm, Maria and Hudson buried their six-year-old son next to Grace in a small cemetery beside the river in the town of Xingqing. As difficult as Samuel's death was for the family, they continued on their way to Shanghai. But saying goodbye to their three oldest children was not easy for Hudson and Maria. As the ship carrying their children moved off down the Huangpu River, they wondered if they would ever see the children again. Around the time the children left for England, the China Inland Mission opened up many new mission stations in China, and nearly everyone had problems with staff being ill or neighbors rioting. Hudson and Maria were kept very busy. They moved to Chin Kiang in the, on the Yangtze River so they could travel to the various mission stations more easily. On July 7th, 1870, baby Noel was born. He was a solid little child, and he got bigger and stronger each day. But Maria did not. Hudson began to worry about her. He just lay in bed with Noel. She just lay in bed with Noel, tucked in beside her. She smiled but looked ashen and frail. After a week, Hudson knew her condition was serious. She was bleeding somewhere inside her body, and he had no way of knowing exactly where so he could stop it. Meanwhile, baby Noel was no longer well either. He now had diarrhea, which is not a big deal for an such not such a big problem for an adult, but for a little baby like Noel, it was serious. Hudson now had a very sick wife and a very sick baby. He spent his time praying and helping to keep them cool and comfortable. But 13 days after his birth, Noel's body gave up and he died quietly, tucked in bed beside his sick mother. Maria, who was too ill to attend the funeral, kissed her baby goodbye and chose the hymns for his funeral. Hudson left the cemetery after burying Noel beside his sister Grace and brother Samuel, but one week later he was back again, this time to bury his wife beside the children. Maria's funeral was one of the largest ever in the area. Everyone wore white, the Chinese color of mourning. Hudson spoke at the service. He told about Maria's missionary parents, her call to China, and her love for God. Maria was 33 years old when she died. Hudson missed Maria terribly. Nothing was quite the same without her beside him. Seven months earlier, at Christmas, the whole family had been together. Now three members of the family were dead. Three were in England and two were left in China. Yet Hudson drew comfort from God and from the fact that one day they would all be together in heaven and nothing would ever part them again. In summer 1871, a year after Maria and Noel had died, Hudson felt it was time for him and Charles to visit England. He needed to spend time with the three older children and report back to the people in Great Britain who supported the mission. As it turned out, three other people from the Lammermuir party went with him back to England. James Meadow was sick and needed time away from China, so he and his wife, the former Elizabeth Rose, were returning home for a while. Jenny Falding had been running several successful boarding schools for the mission, but it had been five years since she'd left England and her parents wanted her to come home for a visit. On the trip back to England, Mrs. Meadows, Mrs. Meadows spent most of the time in her cabin looking after Mr. Meadows. That left Hudson and Charles and Jenny with a lot of time together. On the long voyage home, Hudson and Jenny fell in love and they were married soon after reaching England. 
Hudson returned to China with Jenny, and together they continued their work. They had two children together, Amy and Ernest. While in China, Hudson spent an increasing percentage of his time training Chinese missionaries to go into the interior to preach the gospel. Hudson's sister Amelia and her husband Benjamin Broomhall looked after Hudson's three children, along with their own ten children. They also took over the administrative work of the China Inland Mission in London. They sent out China, China's Millions, the newsletter of the China Inland Mission. They also took care of the missionaries home on leave and interviewed new missionaries for the mission. Stories about missionaries from the China Inland Mission spread around the world. Many of the missionaries were daring and adventurous, just like their founder. Both men and women crisscrossed China, making maps of the areas they went through. John Stevenson and Henry Saltow became the first Westerners ever to cross China from west to east. They covered 1,900 miles in less than three months. Hudson's second wife, Jenny, and two other China Inland Mission women were the first Western women to go deep into inland China. They were on a mission to set up orphanages for children whose parents had died as a result of massive famine that spread across China. Missionaries from the China Inland Mission now no longer just came from the British Isles. There were missionaries from Sweden, the United States, and Australia. The mission quickly spread across China until there was a China Inland Mission work in every province. By the late 1890s, though there were many small secret societies trying to change things inside China. What? By the late 1890s, though, there were many small secret societies trying to change things inside of China. One of these groups was called the Boxers. They hated foreigners and were getting stronger as more people joined their cause. As the boxers, boxers grew in strength, Hudson grew concerned for the safety of the missionaries, especially the single women. At the end of 1898, the China Inland Mission had experienced what Hudson knew was a possibility ever since the day he prayed on Brighton Beach, the murder of one of its missionaries. Bill Fleming, a lively Australian, had been on an evangelistic mission among the Black Miao tribe in the distant southwestern province of Kuei Chau. His friend and helper, Pan Shushan, was himself a member of the Black Miao tribe. When other members of the tribe heard that Pan had left their religion to follow Christianity, they were angry. As Bill Fleming spoke to the crowd, they became even more angry till they rushed forward to attack Pan. Fleming stepped in front of the mob using his own body to shield his friend, and he was killed. Hudson's heart sank as he heard the news of Bill Fleming's death. He wrote, How sad the tidings! Blessed for the martyrs, but sad for us, for China, for their friends. And not only sad, but ominous. It seems to show that God is about to test us with a new kind of trial. His words proved very true. Things were changing quickly in China and changing for the worse. Hudson continued to tell men and women everywhere about the needs of China. He traveled to Australia and New Zealand and on to the United States. Huge crowds gathered to hear him. At Carnegie Hall in New York, 3,500 came to hear him speak, including the President of the United States and the Governor of New York. From New York, he traveled on to Boston for another series of meetings. As he spoke in one of the meetings there, he seemed to forget where he was. Over and over, he said the same sentence. You may trust the Lord too little, but you can never trust him too much. After several minutes, the director of the meeting led Hudson gently from the stage. He was still repeating the same phrase. Perhaps he could see what lay ahead for China. Hudson was now 68 years old and badly in need of rest. Jenny made arrangements to take him to Switzerland, where the fresh air and walks in the mountains helped him to get better. However, it was not long before telegrams began to arrive from the China Inland Mission headquarters in London. Each one seemed to bring worse news than the one before. In China, the Empress Dowager had declared war on foreigners, and many Chinese people had been happy to help her out. Churches were burned to the ground and missionaries' homes looted. A missionary family were killed in their beds. Others were fleeing for their lives. Hudson was shocked. There were his, they were his beloved people, and he was too far away to help. As the telegrams piled up on a table, he told Jenny, I cannot read, I cannot think, I cannot even pray, but I can trust. Thousands of Chinese Christians called secondary devils were also being killed because they were seen as traitors to China. In Peking alone, 15 to 20,000 Chinese Catholics were killed. Those were black days for China. 
By the time the Boxer Uprising had been defeated, 130 Protestant missionaries and over 50 of their children had been killed. The China Inland Mission alone lost 58 missionaries and 21 children. Hudson wept for every one of them. Hudson could only think back to the first days when he had fought so hard not to start a missionary organization and how he had finally come to understand that each person who was called was in God's care. He could do no more than to pray for each of the dead missionaries' families. Slowly, the mission in Hudson began to recover from all the horrible deaths. Hudson and Jenny took long walks in the mountains together. They befriended counts and countesses, peasants and storekeepers. Visitors flooded in from around the world, leaving some to laugh and shake their heads. The Taylors had made a China Inland Mission outpost halfway up a mountain in Switzerland. A year went by. Hudson read his Bible through for the 40th time. He wrote hundreds of letters and prayed constantly for China and the missionaries who served there. The news that Ginny had cancer hardly changed their lives at all. Both of them were already living in the light of eternity. Although she was thin and weak, he told a friend, I couldn't be better cared for or happier. I'm nearly home. That's what Jenny said. She told a friend, I couldn't be better cared for or happier. I'm nearly home. What will it be to be there? The Lord is taking me slowly and gently. And so he was. On July 29th, 1904, Jenny died with Hudson at her bedside. Hudson was now 72 years old and badly wanted to go back to China. There were so many people to encourage there and so many people to thank. So in the spring of 1905, he and his son Howard now also a medical doctor, and Howard's wife, Geraldine, set off on, ha on Hudson's 11th journey to China. And what a trip it was. Hudson was able to visit many areas by train now. Trains were much more comfortable than the wheelbarrows he used to ride in. Everywhere he went, people gathered to listen to him. He had his 73rd birthday at one of the seven China Inland Mission stations in Henan Province. The Chinese Christians made him a huge red satin banner which read, O oh man greatly beloved. Hudson visited China Inland Mission hospitals and orphanages, new mission stations and the home in Hangzhou where he and Maria had survived the riot. He also visited the cemetery where Maria, Grace, Samuel, Noel, and his adult daughter Maria were all buried. Later that day, he spoke to a new group of missionaries with China Inland Mission who were about to go into the interior. He looked at these young people who had left their families and friends to take the gospel message to the Chinese people. And for a moment, he was one of them, a 21-year-old landing in China with no money, no wife, and no plan. Yet he had trusted God, and God had used him. Now, 54 years later, over 18,000 Chinese Christians had been baptized, and the China Inland Mission had 825 missionaries. It's a great privilege to meet you here, he told the group. I have met many here in days gone by. My dear wife died by me here. In spirit, our loved ones may be nearer to us than we think, and God is near, nearer than we think. And Hudson was nearer to his loved ones than anyone might have imagined. On June 3, 1905, several weeks after visiting the graves of his family, Hudson Taylor died quietly in his bed. He was buried beside Maria and his children. His tombstone read, Hudson Taylor, a man in Christ. His life had ended where he had always wanted to be, deep in the heart of China.